All right. So today we have Philip Argyros tell us about Dirac pairings and cyber equipment geometries. Take it away. Thanks. Thank, thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to talk today about a paper that uh, Mario and uh, Michael Ray and I put out a uh, few months ago on uh, the connection or the way that um, Dirac pairings on charge lattices appear in uh, Coulomb branch geometries or cyber witten geometries informally. <clears throat> so the, mo the motivating question for this is what I've written in this box here. If you have a, a four dimensional n equals two supersymmetric field theory, which we know has a Coulomb branch of vacuum. And of course, by the way, you could ask this question for any theory which has like a Coulomb like phase. What is the relationship between the choice of mutually local probe line operators and the geometry of the Coulomb branch moduli space. And why am I asking this question? Well, in general, the, the geometry of the Coulomb branch of the moduli space is something which in, in good situations we can compute exactly. And it has a tremendous amount of information about the theory in question, by, though by no means a complete characterization of the theory. And so it's, it's always interesting to understand what's the dictionary between uh, the, the, the objects that enter into that, that, ge the, that moduli space geometry and physical properties of the corresponding field theory, right? And so this is in some sense trying to explore just one entry in this dictionary. Cool. So let me uh, start with some uh, explanations and caveats. Um, first of all, this choice of probe lines is my uh, language for what was called the global structure of a quantum field theory in the reading between the lines, or, or maybe, I don't know, various people call it the global structure. Certainly in a, in the, in a previous uh, quiver meeting, Inyaki called it the global structure. Um, um, that's because in, in cases of field theories which have a Lagrangian description, a gauge theory description, then the choice of probe lines is uh, equivalent to a choice of the global form of the gauge group plus the values of certain discrete theta angles. And that was explained in the reading between the lines paper of Aharoni, Seiberg, and Tachikawa. Um, so I'm, instead of talking about uh, global forms of gauge groups and so forth, I'm going to focus on the properties of lattices of probe line operators, uh, because that's something which, uh, which generalizes even when you don't have a uh, Lagrangian description of your field theory, okay? Um, now, uh, it's been pointed out and uh, explored in a lot of detail the, the, that the choice of these lattices of probe line operators is closely related to uh, uh, generalized symmetries of, um, of, the th of the theory, at least out on the Coulomb branch. And, this, uh, and that, this will not be my focus. So I'm not gonna mention uh, one form symmetries or anything like that. I'll just stick to these, these, these charge lattices. Um, another uh, thing I should say um, is that much of what uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, was known to experts in one form or another, or at least in some uh, simple examples. And in particular, long ago, Gyoto Muranitsky um, described uh, uh, some of these, the basic uh, idea of these uh, charge and line lattice constructions. And, um, and um, uh, Yuji in some papers described in the case of SU2, um, uh, some SU2 gauge theories, what um, some of this connection between uh, moduli space geometry and these uh, charge lattices. And I should also say that uh, 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 a, a recent paper also from a couple of months ago by Michele Inignaki talks about the same subject though from a much more, um, uh, you know, a, a much more uh, highbrow perspective. Um, and I should end, Relatedly, um, previous quiver meetings have, have 
some overlap with what I'm going to talk about. In particular, there was a there was a nice one by Oren, uh, I forget when, like half a year ago or more. And then the last, the two most recent uh, Quiver meetings also have some overlap with this whole idea of, at least they're much more from the point of view of generalized symmetries and so forth in that you could see in Quiver, uh, in, in Coulomb phases. <clears throat> but anyway, like I said, I'm going to focus on the connection to the actual uh, uh, Coulomb branch geometry and how, it's, how that's related to these structures. So here's the plan of the talk. I'm first going to give a uh, review of charge lattices and line lattices in, uh, in these field theories. Um, and then a lightning review of some necessary ingredients of what enters into a description of a Coulomb branch geometry, so-called special Kähler structures. And then um, I'll apply these in some simple examples, namely n equals four super Yang mills and some n equals three super conformal field theories. And uh, we'll end with a, a, a puzzle, which was, this is all, uh, mostly all of this was in this paper, the paper with Mario and Michael. <clears throat> including this puzzle. And please uh, just feel free to interrupt me with, um, uh, with questions. I, I don't think I'll be able to uh, follow the chat while I'm talking. <clears throat> so the, the main player in all of this is the notion of a charge lattice and its associated Dirac pairing. And you really should think of them as a uh, pair the lattice together with its pairing. That's something called a symplectic lattice. And that's the physical and mathematical object that we're really interested in. So a, any theory with a Coulomb vacuum has such a thing. A, a Coulomb vacuum, remember, is simply a, a vacuum of a field theory uh, in which there's an unbroken uh, uh, abelian uh, uh, gauge uh, symmetry. So uh, let's say it, the rank is this is R if there are R U1 un, unbroken U1 factors in the infrared, right? And that means that there's some set that, that the states, the finite energy states in the theory will carry um, some set of electric and magnetic charges. So two R electric and magnetic charges, two for each U1 factor. Um, so in, in general, a priori, you would say those, that's, that they, that's just some set of charges in the, in the vector space, you know, R to the 2R, you know, R to the 2R, but it actually forms a lattice because of uh, Dirac quantization. And a Dirac quantization uh, says that there is a non-degenerate anti-symmetric bilinear pairing of the set of electric and magnetic charges which is a, a bilinear map into the integers, okay? Um, so with the, with the existence of, of such a non-degenerate pairing, then the set lambda has to be, uh, is forced to be a lattice. <clears throat> um, and then I want to emphasize that the, the, the normalization of, of the Dirac pairing is physical. You don't get to redefine it as you like. It measures some actual physical property of the states in question. Um, <clears throat> in particular, if I have two states if sufficiently localized of uh, electric and magnetic charges P and Q, P, uh, the, the vector of electric and magnetic charges is P for one of them and is Q for the other, then the pairing times H bar over two measures the angular momentum in an appropriate sense, the angular momentum carried by the electromagnetic field uh, sourced by these two guys. And um, if that's not a familiar statement, I highly recommend uh, reading this old review by uh, Coleman called The Magnetic Monopole 50 Years Later. This is not in his Erice lectures, monopole lectures. This is a different uh, review. Um, it's really beautiful and uh, it explains uh, the connection between angular momentum and Dirac pairings and Dirac quantization at length. Okay, good. 
So our, our players are lattices with this symplectic pairing. Those are called symplectic lattices. So let, before I give examples of these, um, of these charge lattices in, uh, in field theories, let me just uh, review some of the basic math of these symplectic lattices. So the first thing is if uh, we, uh, the, the, there's no choice of basis here, but if we choose a basis, let me call them EA, A from one to two R of the lattice, then of course I, a change of basis is any invertible two R by two R integer um, um, can be thought of as a two R by two R integer matrix transforming the basis to a new lattice basis, right? So it has to be invertible over the integers. And then the components of the, uh, of the pairing between those basis elements is then a 2R by 2R anti-symmetric matrix. But obviously its specific form depends on the basis cho chosen. And there is the basic structure theorem for these lattices, which is actually a special case of a much more general theorem that you can, there, are, there exists a set of what are called canonical bases in which, which uh, a kind of skew diagonalizes the uh, symplectic form such that the diagonal blocks have say the D here has positive integer entries arranged in such a way that each entry divides the next entry, DI divides DI plus one. And if you, in that form, this is a, oops, this is a unique form and it completely characterizes, it, it, char it characterizes all the in, sort of basis independent or invariant information in the direct, in the uh, pairing, okay? And these, these uniquely defined integers are called the invariant factors of the pairing. Good. Um, and if all those integers were one, so this would be the, the traditional symplectic form with like minus the identity and the identity on the off diagonal things. Then we say that the symplectic lattice is principal or it's pairing as principal. Okay, this is just definitions and this theorem, this result. These are, these are important because this gives us uh, the language for what kind of basis independent language for describe, for talking about these, uh, these structures. Um, the set of bases, yeah. Is, is there a field in mathematics which explores this uh, such a object? Or it's, you have to do it by yourself? Well, uh, the, the objects are called symplectic lattices and there is a small specialized uh, uh, math literature just on them, but it's not, but more gen, but, they, but in abstract algebra, it appears much more generally as, as a, a subcase of the theory of, um, of, mo of finitely generated modules over principal ideal domains. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the structure theorem of finitely generated modules over principal ideal domains. By the way, some of this stuff is reviewed in appendices in, this, in the paper that uh, this talk is based on, if you want to know more details. Okay. For instance, um, you know, there's, there's an algorithm very, very closely related to the Smith normal form algorithm for computing these invariant factors given a general uh, 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 symplectic form. You said Hermit? I'm sorry? Hermit, you said Hermit normal form? Smith normal form. Smith normal form. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, the, so the set of basis changes which preserve a given form. So for instance, preserve the canonical form. That, that's the way most people work. Um, uh, is, is the subgroup of basis changes. And it's since they're preserving a symplectic form, it's natural to call them a symplectic, uh, the, this symplectic group over the integers, which pres preserves a given form J. So it's, that's the set of, uh, of integer matrix, integer matrix, invertible matrices, which uh, preserve the form in this sense. So MJ and transposes J. So if J was principal, then this would just be what we normally would call SP2RZ. 
But for non-principal J, this as an abstract group does not have to be uh, isomorphic to SP two RZ. Okay, and in from in physics language, thinking about this in terms of those Coulomb branch, uh, those those Coulomb vacua, this is interpreted as the group of possible low energy electric magnetic duality uh, transformations. Okay, just to connect it up with something you may be familiar with. And so now I can, now that we've talked about these invariant factors, I can give you some examples. So you can try to look in, in gauge theories that we know about, ones that have a weak coupling limit so that we can use semi-classical methods and we can try to compute these charge lattices and their Dirac pairings. And uh, this was sort of in principle done back in the eighties for N equals four super Yang Mills theories. So by looking through the literature in, you know, from the late 80s, maybe maybe you have to look maybe in the 90s a little bit, um, you can piece together uh, uh, from the results there, what are the, um, the symplectic, the charge lattices as a function of the, uh, of the, the gauge algebra for N equals four super Yang Mills theories. And it turns out they're not principal. So um, I don't think this was ever, you know, explicitly pointed out in the literature way back then. And it was actually kind of news to me, um, but it turns out for all these theories, except uh, it turns out for E8, F4 and G2, those are the three cases in which the, the charge lattice is principal. All the other cases have, not, have invariant factors which are not one. Okay, so this, it explains why I spent so much time talking about non-principal um, symplectic uh, pairings. Okay, so again, if uh, in, in our paper, we have a review of the arguments, uh, very uh, uh, giving these results. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, maybe I should stop there. This is a, this notion of charge lattices. Remember, I emphasize the thing that we're calling the charge lattice is, is the lattice of charges of actual physical, you know, finite energy states in the theory. We can even talk about these things just because in the Coulomb vacuum, the gauge groups, the U1, are not confining. So you can talk about states carrying an asymptotic gauge charges. Okay, good. So now we're gonna talk about a different lattice, which is sort of closely related to this charge lattice. And this are uh, lattices of charges of line operators. So in a, in a Coulomb phase, in a, in a U1 to the R theory, I can always, I can write down Wilson in a set of Wilson and Atuf uh, line operators, right? And the, uh, the, 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 the integer coefficients Appearing up in the exponent there, in, let's say in the Wilson line operator, and the analogous thing in the Atuf line operators as boundary conditions on the on the uh, bulk fields, um, can be interpreted as analogs of electric and magnetic charges. So I'll call them p-twiddles. They're they're not. You really shouldn't call them electric and magnetic charges. Um, uh, well. I don't know what you should call them, but uh, the, the, a modern way of thinking about them is as, uh, as one form symmetry charges. Um, so the such line operators can be thought of as world lines of infinitely massive probed charged particles. And so uh, the Dirac quantization uh, uh, then our argument says that we can't just put, if we want um, a kind of well-defined line operators, line operators um, uh, um, uh, which are, um, okay, well, okay, we'll, we'll come back to, to this in a second. But the, the, the Dirac quantization, um, a condition between these probe charges and, and the charges of any states in our, my theory uh, implies 
that the direct pairing between these line charges and any of the, the charges of the states um, should be integer, right? Um, that's the direct quantization consistency condition. So this means that these, uh, this allowed set of line charges itself uh, uh, take values in some lattice, which I'll call lambda j, which is, it's in some, it's in this set, this defines it here, basically. It's the set of points which are kind of the lattice of charges, which are uh, dual with respect to the symplectic pairing to the lattice of uh, uh, the, the charge lattice. Okay, so in particular, uh, the, it's certainly true that the Dirac pairing of the charge lattice lambda with itself are all as always integer. So this means that the, the, this uh, Dirac dual lattice um, contains the charge lattice. So we should just think of it as sort of a refinement of the charge lattice, adding extra points, making a finer lattice, okay? And, and as we've uh, said here, we, we give this the interpretation as a lattice of possible probe line operators. And this is what I just said. The charge lattice is a sublattice of this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this Dirac dual lattice. And it's just a little bit of math to figure out that it's a sublattice with a certain index, which is just the determinant of the of the uh, symplectic pairing, of the Dirac pairing, which if, if is just the product of the squares of those invariant factors. And so in particular, if your Dirac pairing was principal, then the, the probe line lattice would actually coincide with the charge lattice. But if not, then it does not. Furthermore, if um, in the case that the charge lattice is not principal, then the, um, uh, the, the, the dual, the, the Dirac dual lattice, the, the set of uh, Dirac pairings on the elements of the Dirac dual lattice are not in general integer. Remember, we only, we only demanded that they are integral with respect to the charge lattice. But if I take two, two elements of the dual lattice, which are not in the charge lattice, then typically their Dirac pairing will just be a fra will be fractional, okay? So, which is just to say that in general, these probe lines are not mutually local. That's the language of, for instance, uh, the reading between the lines paper. Um, or another way of saying it is that they would not be genuine line operators. They would be boundaries of topological surface operators. So this leads you to define a maximal line lattice as a maximal sublattice of the dual of these of these lattice of possible probe line operators, a maximal sublattice, which is which are which is mutually local, for which the Dirac pairing is uh, is the induced Dirac pairing is integral. Uh, it's maximal precisely when uh, uh, th that. When the when this lattice is principal with respect to this Dirac pairing, okay, and you can then you see that it's intermediate between the the charge lattice and the Dirac dual lattice by sort of an equal amount. That is to say, uh, it, it, the in its index in the Dirac dual lattice is the same as the index of the charge lattice in the maximal line lattice, and that's just this square root of this determinant. It's, it's just the Fafian of the, of, of, uh, of the Dirac pairing on the charge lattice, okay? So there's not a unique um, maximal line lattice. And in fact, there's some finite number of inequivalent uh, uh, kind of maximal extensions maximal mutual local, mutually local extensions of the charge lattice. And this number depends <clears throat> on the invariant factors 
of J in some complicated way. So if you remember the invariant factors for uh, SUR plus one was of the form, all of them were one, and then the, the last one was not. So in this very simple case of these very simple invariant factors, then the number of inequivalent um, uh, maximal line lattices is given by this expression where the, the, where the product, where the PK to the NKs is the prime factorization of this uh, non-trivial invariant factor. And when there are many uh, 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 invariant factors not equal to one, I don't actually know a, a nice form for this expression. I don't, counting it just when, when there were, it, when the last two were two here uh, was a little bit of an involved uh, uh, procedure. I think the answer came out to 15 or something invariant, um, uh, inequivalent um, uh, maximal uh, line lattices. And that counting was done in an appendix again in, in our paper. But I don't know the math to get a general formula for general um, uh, general invariant factors. So for SU2, it's three, just to see, I understand. Yeah, for SU2, it should be three. Okay. If, if there's only one invariant factor, so there's just one term in this, which should be uh, two squared minus one is three divided by two minus one as well. So it, it got the right answer. <laughs> Very nice, good. <laughs> Any other questions? Good. So, so that was just this was this this review of these these charge lattices, charge lattices, and their sort of uh, maximal uh, sim, uh, symplectic extension to maximal symplectic lattices, which I'm calling maximal line lattices. Okay, so the question is, how is this related to Coulomb branch geometry? So I need to tell you something about Coulomb branch geometries. And I'm, I'll do this uh, very quickly. Um, and, but again, stop me if there's some questions. So the first thing is to think about the Coulomb branch as a two-step process. It's, it's a Kähler geometry. And in a, on top of that, there's some extra structure called a special Kähler structure. So let's just separate those two. Um, so it's the Coulomb branch is some Kähler complex variety. And you can let's make a simplifying assumption, as is often done, but is not completely physical, that the Coulomb branch as a complex space is simply an R complex C to the R. Okay, so it has no complex uh, singularities. There are there are examples where it does that are known, but that's that's its description as a complex space, but not as, and of course this admits a Kähler, obvious Euclidean structure is Kähler, but um, that's not the Kähler. This, there's a specific Kähler geometry put on a Coulomb branch, and that's not the Euclidean uh, uh, metric on this guy. Um, in, and in general, the Kähler metric of the Coulomb branch is not smooth everywhere. It has non-analyticities, even, even though, as in this, these sets of examples, the, the complex structure is smooth, okay? So let's call the, the, the locus, the metrically smooth subset of the Coulomb branch, I'll call that Coulomb branch star, okay? And it, it turns out basically that this is a connected dense set. And in fact, the metric and non-analyticities come in complex co-dimension. So here's the example to keep in mind. Here is a one complex dimensional Coulomb branch. And there, there's a set of points, these red dots, which are kind of the tips of, I'm trying to try to draw them as little conical singularities where the, the metric is non-analytic, okay? It's still good as, a, as an abstract metric space. It just doesn't have nice metrics on tangent spaces because the tangent spaces aren't defined at those points, okay? 
So that's the what I'm calling the Kaler structure of a Coulomb branch that you want to keep in mind. But there's more structure than that. Uh, that's not the whole Coulomb branch geometry. It has a special Kaler structure. And the, the, the main thing that kind of characterizes the special Kaler structure, I, I, I won't give all the details, but the main thing is that there exists a lattice associated to each point on, uh, on, in the Coulomb branch geometry. So I think of it as a lattice gamma fibered over every point. And if it's an R complex dimensional Coulomb branch, then the lattice is a rank two R lattice, okay? Lattices are discrete objects. So, and they vary continuously and therefore that they're locally constant as they move around on the Coulomb branch. This is just a lattice is a lattice, right? Just moves around. But it's a symplectic lattice. That is to say, it has something like a Dirac pairing on it. Okay, this is part of this, the, the definition of this special Kähler structure. Okay, so, um, so there's more, that, that's not, that doesn't completely characterize a, the special Kähler structure, but of course, but this, uh, this symplectic lattice that appears in the special Kähler structure, well, it's natural to think that this has something to do with the symplectic lattice, which is the charge lattice, or maybe those line lattices, right? So that's my, our main question. What is the relationship between the symplectic lattice that appears in the description of the special Kähler geometry, this low energy geometry, and the charge lattice, or, the, or the, those maximal line lattices and so forth, which, which we can, uh, which as we, as I outlined above, you can just derive from knowledge of the charge lattice and its Dirac pairing. So that's the question that we're asking. So um, let me say a few very quick comments, and I'm going to go over this very rapidly um, about uh, special Kähler geometries and this uh, special Kähler symplectic lattice. So first of all. The special Kähler lattice, like I, the simple, the special Kähler lattice is locally constant over the Coulomb branch, but globally it can have monodromies. So if I if I mark it by marking a basis and then drag it around some non some one of these these metric non analyticities, um, I I can come back to um, the basis doesn't have to come back to itself. It only has to come back to itself up to a one of these symplectic transformations preserving the, um, the symplectic pairing. That's, that's what we call a monodromy, a map from the fundamental group of the uh, punctured, the, the smooth uh, Coulomb branch into uh, this structure group. The elect, well, yeah. Um, there are other um, ingredients in des describing a, um, a special Kähler structure, um, most basically called the, 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 the special coordinates. And we can think of them as a certain holomorphic section of a, a rank 2R vector bundle over the Coulomb branch. And that's associated to a choice of basis um, of this uh, symplectic lattice and which, and it under, under basis changes, this thing transforms covariantly with respect, okay? And then, and, and furthermore, if I go to a canonical basis in which my, my, my special Kähler uh, symplectic form here is, uh, is skewed diagonalized in terms of its invariant factors, then with respect to that basis, the, the, the top and bottom R components of this special section are what are called in the literature, in the physics literature, special coordinates and dual special coordinates. And then you have expressions for the Kähler metric, the matrix of, of, of low energy U1 to the R uh, couplings uh, in terms of this data. So um, let me take a moment to emphasize that um, the, the we if you you can define in this way this this 
this uh, this matrix, this R by R complex matrix of low energy U1 to the R uh, couplings. Um, and if I just chose a general holomorphic section, uh, there would be no re this, this would be just some sort of kind of generic R by R complex matrix. But um, uh, uh, we, we have to put uh, these sort of integrability conditions for or defining conditions for a special Kähler structure is that this uh, special Kähler section is such that this set of coupling status is basically symmetric and positive in an appropriate sense. And notice that when the um, when the uh, the invariant factors are, are not principal, then you have to slightly def uh, uh, revise what you mean by positive definite and, and, and symmetry of this matrix of couplings. So it's really, uh, I, I'm really actually, I think in the physics language, it would be tau times d twiddle, which is what you would call the, the matrix of low energy uh, couplings. Okay. I, I emphasize these ingredients just because they'll come in and play a role when we talk about examples uh, in the next sections. Um, there's a, an equivalent description that's you know sort of less basis dependent of these special Kähler structures in terms of families of polarized abelian varieties. I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to say that in that language, the the special Kähler lattice is just the homology the lattice of, of homology one cycles of the, of the abelian variety, which is fibered over the Coulomb branch. And the um, Dirac pairing on that lattice is inherited from the polarization of those abelian varieties, okay? And uh, this was all written long ago by uh, uh, Danaghi and, and Witten, okay? So sometimes, uh, these special Kähler lattices might be called homology lattices, and we'll call the uh, Dirac pairings on them, or this symplectic pairing on them, the polarization. Okay, so that's my lightning review of some ingredients of special Kähler geometry. But the main thing to think about, the way to think about it, it's, it's this some kind of mildly singular Kähler uh, geometry together with this uh, this locally constant family of symplectic lattices fibered over. Oop, I forgot to put in this uh, reference. Uh, now I'm going to talk about, maybe I should pause there in case there are any questions. No? Okay, now I'm gonna go on to examples. And uh, the simplest ones are N equals four super Yang Mills theory with gauge with some some simple gauge algebra G, and um, the following sort of construction uh, of their uh, of their of their Coulomb branch uh, geometries, um, or at least the ingredients of it, were sort of uh, laid out nicely in a paper that uh, Mario and Antoine and I wrote. Um, uh, like in, I think it was in 2018 or something like that, um, where we were looking more generally at some sort of orbifold Coulomb branch geometries. So the, in these cases, the, the geometry is very simple. It turns out to be a flat orbifold geometry. That's, I'm talking now about the Kähler geometry and the whole question will be about what are the possible special Kähler structures on such a geometry. And so what it is for, if it's a rank R uh, a gauge group, then it's the, the Coulomb branch in the sense of a N equals two section of the full moduli space is uh, C to the R, it's an orbifold of C to the R by the vial group of the gauge group. And what we do is we put a flat metric on C to the R and then the vial group action on that metric is given to us. So I think of that as a representation of, of my vial group W into the group of R by R complex matrices. Um, and so that completely, this orbifold, this then inherits this 
kind of generically flat orbifold. It, 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 can have, it will have curvature singularities along fixed loci of this, of the vial group action, right? Good. So it's a, just a big flat cone, complex cone in some sense. Um, so I now claim that, you know, as we know that we want some, uh, some rank to our lattices with some uh, invariant um, with some uh, symplectic uh, pairings on them. And th those more or less describe my choice of special Kähler structures. So it, for these class of Kähler geometries, I claim that the set of inequivalent special Kähler structures that can be, that, that this Kähler geometry can be um, endowed with are, are in correspondence, maybe not one-to-one -one correspondence, we'll come back to that, but in, in correspondence with the integer, the, the equivalence classes of, of representations of the vial group in these symplectic uh, groups. So embeddings of the vial group in SPK2RZ and equivalent over the integers. And, and I'll tell you what all of these things mean. So I'm gonna to try to give an outline of this, um, of this characterization now. But the point is, if you accept this, then the mathematical question is, oh, let's find all of these, uh, let's find all of these embeddings up to, up to equivalence, and those, will and those will then give us the different possible um, special Kähler structures that could correspond to this given Kähler geometry. I'm a and, bit confused. Um, yeah. the, the, the K that you have here, I thought that this comes from a choice of SK structure. Yeah, so I want to find all the different. Uh, I, I, so you find out so all, the all the different all the different K's for which there is, you know. Okay, it, I, understand. It, I follow. Yeah, yeah. There, there may not, you know, I might pick K to be say principal. That's all that defines K, and I might find no embedding of W into SP two R C. Okay, I got you. Thank Good. you. So I want to know all Ks and all mu's, <laughs> so just all in equivalent mu's. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good. So, uh, so, but let me reiterate, if you find more than one such equivalence class, then uh, there's more than one uh, special Kähler geometry associated with this Kähler geometry. And so there's more than one Coulomb branch geometry. And so, uh, but on the other hand, kind of dynamically, we're thinking that this all is supposed to come from a single field theory. And furthermore, these theories have, are, are actually in their families parameterized by an exactly marginal coupling. And I can always go to weak coupling where I really know what I'm talking about because there I can relate it to a semi-classical gauge theory, gauge theory description. And I think I know what I'm talking about. So what could these different special Kähler's, we will find many different special Kähler structures. What, what do they correspond to in the field theory if we're, we're talking about one field theory? So not to give anything away, the idea is these different special Kähler structures will correspond to different choices of these, uh, of these possible choices of line lattices. So in other words, we're supposed to in interpret the, the, the symplectic lattices that's, that's part of the special Kähler structure as, the, uh, as a charge lattice but it's not necessarily the charge lattice. It could be, I, I want, we want to propose that it is any one of the possible uh, extensions of the charge lattice with these things that we call line lattices. Okay, that's where we're headed. So let me though uh, uh, give you some background for wh where this comes from. So let's say I do have such an embedding and I'll show a construction of a special Kähler structure given such an embedding. 
that will be that will give me a an arrow in one direction of this correspondence. Um, so for so uh, mu of an element is a two r by two r um, integer matrix. Break it up into r by r blocks like this, um, and then uh, find a tau satisfying this equation for all elements of the vial group. It's not trivial that a, a tau that has the, the appropriate, you know, is a symmetric positive constant complex constant matrix exists that satisfies this. But there are some arguments and theorems saying that th that the set of solutions of this equation is always non-empty. And, they're, and it's given in a paper by Kaworsi and Chikati from some years ago. Um, and uh, Philip, the, uh, yeah. where would the, what would be the simplest example for such a situation? Um, the simplest example would be, would, would, would just be taking uh, the SU2 here. In which case the rank is one, and all of these then then it turns out as groups that the the polar that the that the invariant factor kind of doesn't doesn't matter so to speak, and um, and this just becomes sp two z which is the same as sl two z, and so this is these a b c and d are just some integers that depend on w, and here you're looking for fixed points so you have a finite subgroup of SL2Z, and you're looking for fixed points for it in the complex upper half plane. Tau just becomes, symmetry is irrelevant because it's a one by one matrix. And so this is just question, asking for fixed points of finite subgroups of the modular group, okay, uh, of uh, SL2Z. So that would be a simplest example here. And such things always exist. Um, and uh, by some general arguments. And my claim is then that uh, given this, then, and by the way, for certain subgroups, there's not a unique fixed point. There can be whole submanifolds of fixed points, but anyway, let's not go, those would be like the N equals four theories always actually have a one complex parameter family of, Fix points, but anyway, so we so so in those cases we actually have to fix a value of tau to fix our special Kähler structure, but then we have a tau dependent um, uh, map from elements of the vial group into r by r complex matrices. Remember, C and D are r by r integer matrices, but tau is just some r by r complex matrix. So this is a map into r by r complex matrices. And if this condition is satisfied, then it's easy to see that this is a, a morphism, a, a, an embedding of the vial group into um, uh, uh, GLRC, okay? So we, we define a representation in, in, in GLRC. And then some general arguments tell us it must be in the same, that, that as, a, as a representation, at least over the complexes, it is, in other words, it, it's equivalent up to a complex change of basis to the defining representation of the vial group action that we use to define our orbifold geometry. So there, there is, it exists a matrix, a similarity transformation between this representation, row, twiddle, and row. So you can just find, you can just compute it. And then um, you take the flat coordinates on our orbifold, hit them with this matrix M to put them in this basis, so to speak, and then make a 2R uh, component vector out of them by hitting them with, with tau and the identity. And this defines our special section, our dual, our special coordinates and our dual special coordinates on the Coulomb branch. It constructs a special Kähler structure satisfying all the, um, all the requirements. So uh, 
this is a set, this is what uh, this uh, uh, reference spells out in, in more detail in case you're interested. Okay. But, it, it, and it's, I'm not, it's not really original with us. It, it's, uh, it's kind of appears in the literature or is at least implicit in the literature from long ago. Okay. Furthermore, um, if this, uh, if, if this embedding in uh, SBK2RZ, if two such embeddings are equivalent over the integers, that is to say there is a 2K by 2K integer similarity transformation relating them, then it, it, it's, it's straightforward to check that the resulting special Kähler structures are equivalent in the appropriate sense. Okay. So, Maybe that these details are a little bit too technical, but again, the point is simply that I've shown you that if I if I have a Z equivalence class of this embedding, I can construct a special Kähler structure. And I haven't shown the the arrow in the other direction, and in particular, I don't. It's not true that these are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, uh, oh, um, I don't know about that. I actually, I believe they are in one-to-one -one correspondence, but I don't, I don't quite have a proof. Um, well, anyway, that, 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 yeah, I'd have to think about that. Okay, I, I might not have a complete argument that says that every possible special Kähler structure put on this orbifold um, has to be constructed in this way. Though I'm, pro I'm, I'm sort of personally convinced that that must be the case. Okay, so anyway, so let me give some examples. And the, the examples that, I, so we gave, gave some examples in the paper, Mario and Michael and I did. Um, um, it, and I'll give some examples in a slightly different uh, language based on uh, some conversations that I've had with Antoine, Julius, um, uh, Matteo, Mario, and Mitch. Okay, so uh, so this isn't this way of describing it isn't quite in the uh, in the paper. Um, so let's take the example of n equals four super Young Mills, and let's just take S U N S U R plus one gauge group. And remember that it has an associated weight lattice. Um, and this has a set of, of, of uh, sub lattices. The, the, these, the, the weight and root lattices of Lie algebras don't come with any symplectic structure. These are not symplectic lattices. They do come with a metric structure, at least up to an overall you know, normalization. <clears throat> induced by the killing form. But um, so they're kind of metric lattices, not symplectic lattices. But in any case, there's a weight lattice. And there are sub lattices of the weight lattice of SU R plus one, which I'll call gamma sub D labeled by every divisor of R plus one. And, and they have the following property that they're intermediate between the weight lattice and the root lattice. The root lattice is the, okay. And, uh, and so that um, uh, the, it, the, you might, the index of the weight lattice, of, of the root lattice in, as a sub lattice of the weight lattice is R plus one. And so these ones are, are all sort of inter, these kind of intermediate lattices. And this, this is all just a reflection of the Z R plus one center symmetry of, of, S, of center of the group S U R plus one. So anyway, this is some uh, Lie algebra fact. And furthermore, what's special about these sub lattices is that they are Thiel invariant. That means for each, such lattice D, there is an embedding of the, uh, an associated embedding of the vial group into GLRZ, okay? 
a certain integer, integer R by R matrix representation or representation over the integers of the vial group. Good. Um, then we can form the following. Uh, so far, we have we the, these are uh, rank R lattices, and we're interested in constructing um, uh, a symplectic lattice representation of the vial group. So, um, uh, so for rank two R uh, lattices. So what we'll simply do is that will that representation associated to D will will simply be the direct sum. We'll make a block sum of the of this uh, of row twiddle sub D and its kind of conjugate guy row twiddle sub R plus one divided by D. Right. So if you're doing SU six, there would be a row one and a row six, a row twiddle one and a row twiddle six, that would give me one representation, but there'd also be a row twiddle two and a row twiddle three, and that would give me another representation. And I claim, and it's, and it's straightforward, and it's fairly straightforward to check. Uh, maybe we don't have a proof in general, but I think it's clear that, the, that this representation then gives a representation well, it's certainly an integer 2R by 2R representation, but it actually preserves a symplectic form. And in fact, it preserves a principal symplectic form. That's why I just wrote SP without it. the K here. In other words, is the principal uh, pairing. Okay. So here is a, con a construction in this case Maybe, maybe not of all, in fact, I believe it's not, I'm pretty sure it's not of all, but of a set of, of these embeddings and therefore of a set of special Kähler structures. Now, these, these, um, uh, uh, these different uh, uh, embeddings are related to um, it, it, kind of this division into sort of, uh, you can think of them as making certain choices of your electric and magnetic charge lattices or, and, or at least the sub lattices actually kind of uh, determined by their their uh, their center symmetry charge, and so they can. If you if if you're familiar with the uh, details of the reading between the lines paper, this the, the you'll you immediately see that these representations turn out to be in um, one to one correspondence with the global uh, structures of the SU R plus one, uh, where the gauge group has global structure SU R plus one mod ZD, um, that's some global form of the gauge group. Um, and with no um, of these, none of these discrete theta angles turned on. Okay. So we, we've kind of naturally, or in a simple way, constructed examples of, uh, uh, we've constructed special Kähler structures corresponding to each of these guys. And we constructed examples which all had principal pairing here. And remember that the corresponding maximal line lattices, um, th those were the ones that were dis dis discussed in these, in these reading between the lines papers, were, are, are all have principal pairing on them. So this le leads to the, this leads to the, the following conjecture, and this was, uh, kind of argued for in a different way in the paper with Mario and and Michael, that in general we we would guess that every every possible spe special Kähler structure that can be associated to a given Coulomb branch Kähler geometry will be will will correspond to different choices of line lattices. So they should correspond to the um, the symplectic lattices, which 
con contain uh, the charge lattice and it has a, a, a the symplectic structure on it, the one induced from the symplectic structure on the charge lattice, up to and including all the different possible maximal, principally, principal maximal line lattices. So that if this conjecture is true, then you should be able to check it by just starting to, com to compute these special Kähler structures, let's say in these simple n equals four and see that there's a match between these things. Okay, and in, 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 a, in a few cases where we have been able to check this, some low rank cases, SU2, SU3, um, and maybe in, 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 in ongoing conversations with this group, SU4 so far, um, uh, we, have, we have seen, uh, this is all seems to be matching. So kind of support for this conjecture. And I should also emphasize that uh, if you read uh, those references by uh, Yuji Tachikawa that I mentioned right at, right at the beginning of the talk, he had all, also essentially made this correspondence in the case of SU, SU2, sort of saw that this worked there. So, um, okay, good. So this leads, at least if you're going to analyze the n equals four cases, the following math questions and, uh, and th these seem very well posed mathematical questions that you can that you can try to answer. So let me uh, I know I'm, uh, I've, I've run out of time, but let me very briefly just remark on the story, try to generalize this away from these examples that we have so much control over the n equals four super young mills cases. And let's go to the next simplest case a certain class of n equals three superconformal field theories whose Coulomb branch Kähler geometries are also flat orbifolds, but they're not by uh, vial groups, but by complex crystallographic reflection groups. Vial groups turn out to be real crystallographic reflection groups. So this is a slight generalization. They break n equals four supersymmetry to n equals three, but they're almost the same. Um, so you, you're given the, uh, the representation, which gives you the action, the orbifold action. And then it's the same story. You're trying to classify the, uh, the uh, representations in the symplectic, integer symplectic groups up to integer equivalents to classify special Kähler structures. So, <clears throat> and, and this is what I'll end with. There's a puzzle. Um, Kaorsi and Chikati in this, that paper that I mentioned before, point out um, in passing at some point that there are certain of these uh, complex re reflection groups which do not admit an SPK 2R, they all admit, by the way, SPK 2R Z embeddings. The word crystallographic here is almost the same as saying that they admit such an embedding. But the, um, uh, the question is for what K? And they give an argument that there are certain ones which can't possibly admit ones with principal polarization. Um, and that theory would seem to be a counterexample to this conjecture because we would say that we can always take our charge lattice and make a maximal extension of it, which will be a principally a principal uh, maximal line lattice. And if these are in correspondence with the special Kähler structures, then there should always be at least one or maybe many um, uh, principally principal special Kähler structures. And this says, the, this, are, this observation, of course, in Giacotti says that there are cases in which they, such things do not exist. Um, so interpreting in the terms of line lattices, these would say that these are a set of theories which do not admit a special Kähler structure corresponding to any maximal line lattice. So what does this mean physically? I don't know. And 
a, the specific example, and there are many other examples that you, well, a, a, a handful of other examples. No, no, I guess an infinite set of other examples that you can look at. I'm not sure how, how large the class is, but there are a set of a known set of examples. Um, um, and the one given in Kaursi and Chikati is a certain rank two complex reflection group called number eight in the Shepherd Todd classification of these groups. And, um, and this theory is a n equals three superconformal field theory for which there's a known string construction, namely as an, an exceptional S fold given by Iñaki and Diego a long time ago. And, and it was pointed out that, that their exceptional S fold construction actually uh, gave this particular orbifold Coulomb branch geometry in this recent paper by um, Justin, Mario, and Gabi. So th this gives us confidence that this is not just some uh, weird uh, um, Coulomb branch special Kähler geometry, which has no associated conformal field theory. I mean, there's nothing that get, if I write down a special Kähler geometry, maybe I'm just fooling myself and there isn't an associated field theory, right? But this gives us confidence that there really, this should make, we have to make physical sense of this. There is an associated conformal field theory, but then there's this puzzle. And I don't know the resolution to this puzzle. I don't know how to interpret this fact. So I'll end there. All right, then let's thank Philip. We have questions other than the one that Philip raised. <laughs> we can give people a minute. Right, so then uh, since we're already over time, I'd say let's thank Philip again. <laughs> and I'll end the recording.